talks which have large um which have largely been looking at the the problems so i'm i'm going to be really focusing more on solutions today um but just to recognize that that the problems are large um the uh, most recent science coming out around climate change particularly from the intergovernmental panel on climate change which is the un body set up to to monitor the the, the science as it develops um has basically identified that unless we significantly reduce our emissions um, by 2030. I could just remind people to mute yourselves um, if you're if you're not speaking, just helps with background noise. Thank you. Um, so we've really got sort of seven years to, to, to really, really significantly get our, our emissions down because we have a, a budget of how much carbon we can continue to put in the atmosphere before we cross the, the 1.5, if not two degrees threshold. Um, and if we carry on as we are, we'll have blown that within the next few years. So what the IPCC is saying, any further delay will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable future. Which is pretty stark <clears throat> kind of prospect, particularly, I think, for those of us um, with children. I've got three um, now young adults. Um, and when, when they talk about predictions for 2050, what goes on in my head is, that's how old my kids, that's about how old I am now, that's how old they will be in 2050, um, which doesn't feel terribly old. Um, and it has a really massive impact on um, the future that I imagined and dreamed for them. Um, and that's one of the things that really got me involved in activism in the first place, um, as well as a sort of lifelong love of the natural world. So, and just to sort of reference there as well, I'm always very aware when I'm watching the catastrophic events that are happening around the world, particularly in the developing world, um, that I don't love my kids more than other people love theirs. Um, and that this is this is a fight for all of us and it's about the things that we hold most dear. So the other thing which um, we need to be aware of um, at the moment in terms of the science is this uh, the emissions gap report from 2020 which kind of looks at the difference between what we need to be doing and what we're actually doing um, and it's vast um, we just we're nowhere close to the the level of change that we need to um to, to be implementing at this point um and what they're saying is that we've left it so late now that incremental change is no longer an option broad-based economy-wide transformations are required to avoid closing the window so at this stage, really every, it's not even every year, every month, every week matters and every choice matters. And we know that this is already having a significant impact on human health all around the world. And, and these problems will only increase. I'm not going to go through this slide in great detail, but just to kind of highlight the breadth of issues. So the heat waves, um, we experienced this in the UK last summer, but obviously in some parts of the world, we're particularly if we cross the 1.5 degree threshold, there's a really significant risk of wet bulb temperatures, which are above the survivable limit for human beings. Um, and in those areas of the world, many people don't have access to air conditioned shelter. Um, and then of course, air pollution is already killing over 7 million people every year. Um, and that's only the tip of the iceberg of all of these other conditions, um, which people then, um, experience with in in terms of chronic disease um, over many years extreme weather events of course um, disrupt people's health there's immediate risk of death or injury but also often um, significant um, impacts on local infrastructure so fresh water supplies food supplies access to um, even just access to other members of the family just to check where they are um, are they okay? But also, of course, getting staff into hospitals, into pharmacies, getting patients into hospitals, and sometimes it's the hospitals themselves that are impacted as well. Um, pandemics, don't need to tell anyone about the impacts of that. Um, climate change is one of the seven factors which increase the risk of future pandemics. Um, but of course, looking at other infectious diseases, vector-borne diseases, um, things like dengue, malaria, Zika virus, we're seeing the geographical area um, in which these vectors can um, thrive increase and also the, the, the period of time during the year in which um, their, their, their activity um, and, and infections occur. 
Same with waterborne disease. So again, partly due to contamination of water supplies during things like floods or droughts where water supplies are reduced, um, but also the warmer waters encourage growth of things like toxic algae, cholera, et cetera. And of course, all of these issues impact um, food and water security, which is really going to become a significant issue over the next 10 to 20 years. We're already seeing reductions in crop yields, and this is driving mass migration and conflict around the world. <clears throat> so that's a sort of global perspective. If we look at the um, UK, again, could I just remind people to um, mute themselves um, to reduce background noise? Um, if we look at the UK specifically, so yes, pandemics, air pollution, so up to 38,000 deaths per year. Um, statistics can be a bit dry, so just to highlight this little girl here, Elika Ali Deborah died at the age of nine in South London um, around 10 years ago now, um, and she was the first person in the UK to have um, air pollution uh, identified specifically um, as a contributor to her cause of death by the coroner. Um, last year, as I mentioned, we experienced heat waves, which also had impacts on hospital infrastructure. So IT systems, cooling MRI scanners, keeping our medications stored at um, appropriate temperatures, um, floods and storms. So several people, particularly several, um, quite a lot of people, particularly in the sort of north and west of the country, um, have been flooded out of their homes more than once. Um, and we know that this has significant long term issues in terms of mental health, particularly depression, anxiety. PTSD. Um, food security. So in the UK, we are food insecure. We import around 50% of our food. And we've ex been experiencing this recently with the reduction in fruit and vegetable supplies due to abnormal weather in southern Europe and North Africa. A few years ago now, the head of the Environment Agency warned that we would not have enough water within 25 years. Um, and that continues to be a problem. And I saw in the news recently plans to um, extract water from Wales and bring it um, in down into London, which of course has all sorts of, of other um, sort of cascading effects for the people in Wales, um, but also in terms of that amount of water being poured into the, the rivers downstream. Um, and then of course, when we think about mass migration, we tend to think about the global south, but in fact, if you look at the areas of land projected to be below annual flood level by 2050, even in the UK, um, there's likely to be quite a lot of internal migration within our own country as well. So just to identify as well um, what we call the inverse climate law, the people that are being impacted the hardest already um, and, and yet are least responsible are those on the lowest incomes around the world, so globally, but also within our own country. Um, so we, we see the poorest 50% are responsible for only about 10% of lifestyle consumption emissions, whereas the richest 10% um, are responsible for almost half. So there's that real kind of injustice of who's causing the problem and, and who's suffering. And that's climate change is not the only area in which we see this. In this country, we have staggering levels of health inequality, which only seems to be increasing year by year. Um, we know that whether or not people are healthy is determined primarily by their circumstances and their environment, not so much their genetics, not so much their own lifestyle choices. And we talk about lifestyle choices as if they were completely free choice. Um, but for people living in the poorest communities, access to parks, to green space, to healthy food, to the time to cook healthy food, the facilities to cook healthy food when they're working two or three jobs just to try and keep their homes heated and put some food on the table. Um, so what we see is, you know, in, in terms of the impact, um, A, we see, you know, up to 10, maybe 20 years of difference in life expectancy between people at the lowest end of the health of the um, of the income spectrum and people at the highest level. Um, you know, it's 10, 20 years of life, and we, we just don't seem to be angry enough about this. Um, and part of this is around our food system, which is um, extremely toxic, not just to the environment, but also to our population, the amount of meat, dairy, highly processed fat, um, you know, fats, sugars, salts that in, in what we're eating. Um, so we've now got 60, you know, nearly two thirds of the adult population classed as overweight or obese in this country, and only about a third participating in, in any kind of 
level of activity, um, even just once a week. So if we think about what makes people healthy, um, as I said, you know, yes, there's age, sex, hereditary factors, but then we've got all these community factors, the built environment, what's available to people, um, the toxins that they're exposed to. And as you work out in this diagram, you get to the natural environment, which is the thing that supports everything else. Um, the very basic kind of our most basic needs, fresh air, clean water, food um, and, and then the natural habitat. So we've got really big problems. Um, and, and the sad thing is that despite being a sector which is based on the principle of first do no harm, healthcare is a significant part of the problem. In fact, if the healthcare sector globally were a country, it would be the fifth largest emitter of greenhouse gases on the planet. And as I've mentioned earlier, health services are also vulnerable. Um, so we've certainly had hospitals flooded in the UK. Obviously, in the global south, we've seen entire hospitals decimated by storms health systems um, decimated. So um, we know that A, we need to stop being part of the problem, but also we need to become more um, resilient. So all of this bad news is, is sometimes quite overwhelming and, and certainly a lot of young people are really suffering from this. Um, this is a big study um, around of around 10,000 young people between the age of 16 and 25, around 10 countries around the world, and 75% of them felt that they were frightened of the future because of climate change. And this was not a group of people who were uh, recruited through climate change um, sort of activities. This was a site that just did kind of random surveys and you just sign up and, and you get paid for doing the survey. So there were not, um, there wasn't any particular bias in terms of the selection. Um, and you can see some of the other results here, you know, four out of 10 hesitant to have their own children because of climate change. Um, you kind of think, you know, what kind of state has the world got into that our young people feel this way? Um, and also nearly two thirds feeling that their governments are failing and betraying them and lying about the effectiveness of their actions. And there are real issues there about sort of institutional betrayal. Um, and, you know, when you look at the broader impacts um, on children and young people around the world, the future that they're that they're looking forwards to, um, it becomes, it, it, you could almost kind of frame this as a, as a safeguarding issue for a generation. So where do we find the good news? Well, the good news is that the stuff we need to do to tackle climate change in our communities is an absolute gift for health. So if we look at these blue lozenges down the side here, this is the sort of epidemic of uh, non-communicable chronic disease, which is causing so much suffering in our populations, but also hu creating huge demand on our health services. And if you look down this side, so you see the things that we need to do to reduce our emissions. So stop burning fossil fuels, um, both for transport and for energy, reduces air pollution, has immediate positive effects, particularly in terms of physical, um, of, of respiratory health, but also pretty much any other condition that you can think of. These particles are so small, they get through the blood brain barrier, they, they cross the placenta, and they set up inflammation all over the body. So they're linked to pretty much every condition that you can think of. At the same time, increasing active travel and improving public transport, because we've got people out of cars, makes them more active. We know that physical activity is really good for our physical health and our mental health. The same with increasing access to green space. So we take cars out of cities or re significantly reduce the number of cars in cities. You then get more space for um, urban green space. And we know that has huge positive effects for physical and mental health. Um, again, looking at our diets, reducing meat and dairy, reducing the level of processed food, more locally grown plant based diets, improves our nutritional level um, and also has you know, really, really positive benefits in, in terms of some cancers, diabetes, obesity. Um, we improve home insulation, then we don't have people sitting in cold, damp, moldy environments. Um, which, you know, I worked for many years with people who were living in exactly those conditions who also had COPD and depression, et cetera. And it's, it's just it's just terrible for people's health. Um, and it also means if they can heat their homes and afford to eat, then maybe they can afford, you know, a better diet. So the people, the, the great news is that the people who benefit most from these kind of changes are the people in the lower income um, brackets who are suffering the most from these diseases. So it really helps to reduce health and social inequalities as well. So actually, that's all good news. It's win-win. It's stuff. Why wouldn't you want to do it anyway? 
So what is the um, NHS doing? So across all four of the devolved nations, um, there have been net zero commitments in England. This is by 2040 for our uh, emissions that we control directly, our direct emissions, and then 2045 for the sort of supply chain to emissions that we can influence. Wales has actually committed to um, net zero by 2030 for public services. Uh, but to reduce emissions, we need to know where they're coming from. So the NHS has done a lot of work to look at actually mapping where our emissions are coming from. And what's very interesting when you look at this pie chart is that when we think about sustainability, we tend to think about estates. So we think about lights, energy, heating, travel. Um, but when you look at where the emissions are coming from, so 20 percent medicines and chemicals, 10 percent medicines and uh, medical equipment, 5% anaesthetic gases and, and inhalers. And then you think about, okay, so why are we traveling? Why are we using these buildings? Why are we using the water and creating the waste? Well, these are all clinical, you know, a lot of this is clinical decision-making. So in fact, when we think about sustainability in healthcare, um, we need to think about the fact that it's, it's, it's actually not just estates that we need to make the difference. This is looking at primary care. So 65% of the emissions of primary care are clinical-led emissions, so pharmaceuticals, inhalers, medical equipment. So we can't leave this to estates departments. The clinical teams have to get involved if we're going to achieve net zero in healthcare. Uh, and this was recognised by the Royal College of Physicians back in, I want to say, 2016, um, where they recognised sustainability as um, a seventh domain of quality um, that should run through and moderate all of the other domains. So this is what CSH has been working on for the last what, 14, 15 years now. Um, and we've put together, um, well, I say we, I joined only a year ago. Um, they've put together what they call the sustainability and quality improvement framework. So we know that quality improvement is one of the things that drives innovation and change in clinical services. So latching onto that gives us the opportunity without particularly additional investment um, to make all of those um, QI projects, ideally sus QI projects, so that we're achieving sustainability at the same time as improving clinical outcomes. And it maps very well onto existing QI frameworks you may be familiar with, things like plan, do, study, act cycles, etc. So what's different about it? Well, the first thing is the sustainable value equation. So rather than just thinking about cost effectiveness, so the, the clinical outcome and how much it costs, we broaden our perspective to think about, well, what's the outcome for the population as a whole? Um, remembering that the patient is and, and the population are not kind of competing groups. The patient is part of the population. But we also think about kind of wider in terms of supply chain workers, um, thinking about a more sort of global population approach as well. And then in terms of, of costs, we think not just about the, the money, but also about what's the environmental impact and weight that equivalently with the financial impact and try and reduce negative social impact, ideally positive social impact um, with every innovation or change. So this is not intended as an equation that we put in, put numbers in and come out with a number that's you know magically good or not good at the end. It's really an approach to thinking and decision making. Um, so it's the kind of thing that we can you know can embed in business cases that we can um, use to to assess any new treatment. Or, or, or care pathway. The other part of this is what we call the principles of sustainable healthcare. So if we want to reduce the health impact of, um, of, of healthcare, then the whilst not reducing the quality of care, the, the first thing to think about is, well, we can do that by reducing the amount of activity, just do less. But how can we do less? Well, the first and most important thing is prevention. So if we can implement, if you remember that previous slide about healthcare benefits, um, those things that we need to do to tackle climate change, we can dramatically reduce over time um, the amount of chronic disease in the population. And that reduces the demand on healthcare services and hence the environmental impact of healthcare services. Um, we can also empower patients to take a greater role in managing their own health and health um, conditions. Uh, and we know that where we do this, we tend to see um, more effective, more efficient treatment. Um, we can strip out waste in, in our pathways. So things that we're doing too much of, things that are potentially are causing harm to people, like over prescribing, over investigating. And then for the activity that we need to continue, because we're not going to enter fairyland where everybody's well all the time, we'll still need to do some healthcare activity. We then need to look at how can we um, use low carbon alternatives to what we're doing already and how can we manage our resources better? 
So what you can see from this is that sustainable healthcare is not a poor relation. It's 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 high quality care, potentially even even higher quality care than what we're offering at the moment, because it's really seeking to go upstream to 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 prevent illness, um, to empower people to to be more engaged with managing their health. So it aligns really well with uh, agendas around social value, personalized care, tackling health inequalities. It saves money, um, which is you know all. All of our SUSQI projects have either been cost neutral or save money, strips waste out of the system, which means it frees up capacity. And it seems to really motivate staff to engage with QI. So what, what we've seen, even with really staff who are really burnt out post COVID, um, that it re-energizes people because a lot of people care about this. They're making changes at home and then they come into work and feel like all of those values have to go out the window and they see all the waste and and what have you. And that's not good for people's mental well-being. So engaging in, in and, and really promoting sustainable healthcare supports staff well-being um, and potentially then also retention and recruitment, which is, of course, a major issue in the NHS at the moment. So I'm going to run very briefly through um, some examples of how we apply this and what it looks like in practice. So these driver diagrams of the, the, the principles, um, these can be presented to teams and, and they just kind of you just get them to say, OK, you know, what are your change ideas at these different levels? So if we think broadly across um, all of healthcare, so prevention, we're looking at getting out of our silos, working with our local government, with our local communities, advocating for things like home insulation, better public and more active transport, changes to our food systems. Um, then there's things that we're already doing that perhaps don't think about sustainable, but when you reframe it like this, actually they are. So vaccination, smoking cessation, alcohol services, screening to pick up conditions before they become chronic. Um, and, you know, just thinking about, you know, in terms of, of the impact of these sorts of things, you know, this is from Public Health England, looking at the impact of even just 30 minutes of regular exercise a day. Um, you know, if we had a tablet that had these these um, these amazing um, impacts, we'd be prescribing it all the time. And this is an um, example from the kidney disease course. So looking at sort of pre kidney disease, what are the things that make a difference? So, yes, you know, alcohol and smoking, but massively diet, um, potassium and vegetable intake, physical activity um, makes such a huge difference to people's risk of, of chronic kidney disease. Uh, and how can we get involved in this sort of thing as, as, as healthcare services? Well, we can use our status as anchor institutions um, to be sourcing local food, to be introducing people to plant-based diets, um, to you know just, just reducing the amount of meat and dairy and, and, and processed food that we're supplying to our patients. I mean, how can we expect them to recover when we're giving them food that we know is, is pretty toxic? So there's a few hospitals around the country that have signed up with an organization called Food for Life, which started working with food um, with with schools, but now works um, quite a lot in healthcare as well. Sustainable travel. So this is Manchester University um, NHS Foundation Trust, who, through a range of different um, uh, innovations, have have really supported um, their staff to switch to active and public transport, um, and and they've now got more than forty percent of their staff using sustainable transport to and from work. Um, this was a report that was um, written by one of our fellows a few years ago, looking at um, commissioning for mental health services and how we need to be pushing upstream um, and really dealing with the causes of mental health um, problems and, and, and poor mental well-being. Um, so it's a really, really good document. It's worth having a look at how we, we work in terms of prevention and mental health. And then thinking about patient empowerment. So things like patient apps for collaborative care. Um, where patients can kind of have a look at their own results, can upload their own data for chronic diseases like diabetes, kidney disease. Um, they've got access to all the leaflets and stuff that you might otherwise have given them that otherwise get you know lost, eaten by the dog down the back of the sofa. Um, can't find them when they need them, but they're all there on the app. Um, and some if these apps are used to kind of maximum potential, mean that they can we can start to tailor their um, review regime to when they need to be seen rather than just bringing them in routinely every X number of months, um, which of course saves time um, both for the patients and for staff. Um, things like personalised care and, and support groups, obviously. Um, this is a lovely um, project by the Mental Health Foundation where they're teaching students in school to teach other kids about um, issues around mental health. 
Um, and of course, peer to peer learning, we know, is, is, is extremely effective. And it also empowers these kids that become the actual trainers. Um, this is looking at patient, um, uh, a patient app called Patient Knows Best, and they worked with a number of hospitals around the country, looking at the reduction in the number of appointments um, and also paperwork. Um, and you can see the amount of um, carbon emissions that were that were reduced. Um, and it's just, you know, when when you when we're presenting these kind of things, it's often really helpful to translate that into something that's a bit more intuitive, like car miles um, is as an equivalent. Um, and and also, you know, they they looked at the uh, benefits in terms of fresh water saved, um, amount of waste, etc. This is an example of, of empowering people by just getting them out of bed when they're in C CICU. Um, and, and the result of this was much more rapid recovery, reduced ventilation, reduced um, overall stay, which, of course, then relates to really significant financial savings and also carbon savings, because we know that acute hospitals are the most intensive um, area of, of health care for uh, environmental impacts. So think about lean pathways. Um, so things, as I mentioned already, sort of over prescribing um, and, and over investigation um, and streamlining our care pathways, but also also alternatives to prescribing. So things like lifestyle medicine, social and green prescribing, which is also empowerment. It's also a low carbon alternative. So if we think about over prescribing, we know from the um, Department of Health over prescribing report in 2021, um, about £300 million worth of medication goes unused annually, and only 16% of patients take their medicine as prescribed. It's a pretty shocking figure, isn't it? Um, so that just basically tells us that we're, we're not thinking as hard as we should be when we're prescribing. We're not engaging the patient enough in making those decisions um, and having really honest, open, non-judgmental conversations about, do you want to take this medication? Do you think you will take it if we, you know, if we send you home with it? So alternatives to that, um, things like green prescribing, which, of course, as opposed to pretty much any tablet that you can prescribe, which is always going to have side effects of some description, um, green prescribing, generally, there's a, such a wide range of impacts and they're all positive. So there's the direct impacts of just spending time in nature. We know that our brains evolved in nature. We're much more they're much more relaxed in nature. There's chemicals that we breathe in that are made by trees that are good for our blood pressure and our cardiovascular health. And then, of course, if you're getting out in nature, you're usually physically active, um, which we've alluded to earlier, um, has huge um, physical and mental health benefits. Often it's in groups. So you're building um, social networks, uh, social identity, sense of belonging um, and sort of tackling that again, epidemic of social isolation that we have, and often learning uh, meaningful activities as well and sort of having a reason to get out of the house. So I wanted to share with you um, a short video um, of that just shows the, the potential power of, um, of green prescribing. I suffer with fibromyalgia and arthritis, and all my life I've suffered with pain. And um, I ended up on high dose opioids to cope with this pain. Um, I was on them for over 12 years and I eventually became totally housebound. We have discovered that being out in fresh air and walking is a natural pain reliever. And so free therapy for depression and anxiety and all sorts of things. I've lost over seven stone in weight now and gradually getting fitter and fitter. Um, so yeah, I'm just now a, a walking fanatic. <laughs> I... Sorry about the buffering issues there. I don't know what was going on. I thought it was downloaded. Um, but, you know, I worked with so many um, women like Louise um, when I was working in addictions um, who were sort of housebound on huge doses of opioids um, and, and the impact that you can see across her physical, mental health, as her, her self-confidence um, is, is really um, not to be underestimated. This is another example from, again, mental health. So this was a, a sort of tertiary quaternary, actually, referral centre for anxiety disorders. 
um, particularly a lot of people with very severe OCD, and they were concerned about the, the nutritional standard of the food they were being offered, and they asked to be able to grow their own food. Um, and they set up this um, these sort of um, vegetable growing area, which they've now incorporated into um, sort of actual therapy for their OCD and their anxiety, um, alongside the fact that they're learning skills about growing food and about cooking. Um, they've set up a, a, a resident-led cafe um, and, and, and supply food to the hospital kitchen. So they're learning skills. It's part of their therapy, getting all of those benefits of, of access to green space. If we come back to if you know if we're gonna if we're gonna stick with prescribing, um, and obviously sometimes we do need to be prescribing medication. Um, this is a study looking at um, antipsychotic depot medication um, and the difference between what's generally prescribed nationally and what the actual guidelines say. Um, and if you reduced the um, the dose and the frequency um, or, or the, the 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 frequency of giving these injections. Um, there was huge um, potential carbon savings and financial savings and, of course, positive social impact. So patients don't have to have people coming around to give them an injection as often, which is often quite a negative intervention um, interaction. Um, they have reduced side effects and, of course, it frees up staff time and capacity. Um, so again, this is another one, just streamlining pathways. So patients with um, HIV used to be seen routinely every six months, but because of the improvement in the effectiveness and tolerability of treatment, the staff felt that actually they didn't need to be seeing them every six months, even though that's what the guidelines said. Um, so for people who were stable on their medication, they offered the, uh, the chance to reduce to an annual review. So if you think about the triple bottom line, so in terms of clinical um, out, outcomes, this is actually a real motivator for people to improve their adherence and, and settle down on their medication. So potential positive clinical outcomes, you know, huge environmental and um, financial benefits. You know, this is this is a salary. This is another member of staff, isn't it? Just by stripping out um, one um, one appointment per year for these patients. And of course, it's much more convenient for them. There's less time off work and the staff have more job satisfaction because they're focusing on those with higher needs and not just seeing people for the sake of seeing them. Uh, this is again, very simple one. Stop sticking cannulas in people just because they walk through the door of A&E. Um, again, significant carbon and financial savings, plus reduced infection risk and reduced patient discomfort. Um, we see lots of PPE projects. Lots of them, however, are kind of limited or blocked by the infection prevention and control team. This was actually led by the IP, um, IPCT um, and it was a fantastic project focusing on one theme per week, really looking at educating staff so they knew what I, um, what PPE they were supposed to be using, um, which led to significant reduction, um, particularly in apron use, um, but also you know, in terms of social impact, much more confidence among the staff about when and what they're supposed to be using um, and interest in sustainability. Looking at low carbon alternatives, um, we tend to think immediately about things like low carbon inhalers and anaesthetics, um, and those are the biggies. I mean, if you look at, um, for example, desflurane, which is two and a half thousand times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide, um, but you know all of them are, are much more powerful as greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide. Um, encouragingly, the NHS we've we've been really reducing desflurane use, and it's now due to be phased out by um, the early part of next year. Um, ongoing fairly you know decent sized problem is is nitrous oxide um so various different approaches have been tried to this one is just you know figure out that you know th this was um a project where they went and talked to the surgical department the maternity department you know how much nitrous oxide do you think you're using and then they went to estates and said no we're using loads more than that well there's leaks in the system so they really kind of focused on removing unnecessary pipes, fixing leaks, um, and had an absolutely massive impact um, on costs, on carbon emissions, um, just, just by actually, you know, making sure the system's not leaking. Um, with nitrous oxide, of course, one of the places it's used a lot is in Entinox in um, uh, maternity wards. So looking at, you know, how can we reduce this being released into the environment? So using masks which actually scavenge the exhaled um, nitrous oxide back um, and, and capture it. And that's then um, put into cracking technologies into these containers which break it down to nitrogen and oxygen, which of course are absolutely harmless. It's not perfect, there's still leakage around it because obviously the patient's still breathing out nitrous oxide. 
um, even when they haven't got the mask on. So another option is to move away from um, inhales um, general anesthetics where required. Sorry, could you mute yourself, please? Um, so shifting to things like local anesthesia or total intravenous anesthesia. So Haley, can you unmute yourself? I muted all and I've accidentally muted you. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Alice. Um, yeah, the other thing is, is to think, you know, the, the operating theatres are, you know, one of the, the real hotspots in terms of environmental impact in acute hospitals. So switching back to, you know, what we used to have when I trained, which was um, reusable gowns that we washed rather than, or we didn't wash, the hospital laundry did, um, rather than things that go into the bin. <clears throat> and this was, sorry, losing my voice. This was the green surgery challenge that we, which we ran a couple of years ago, and this was one of the projects um, which was run through that. Asthma inhalers, um, I'm sure many of you are aware of, of this, you know, the, the, the kind of standard inhaler, the, the blue MDI that you, you see um, most people using. That's the equivalent, one of those is the equivalent of about 175 miles of driving, whereas a dry powder inhaler is only four miles. Um, but actually, sustainability in asthma care is about much, much more than just switching inhalers because we have one of the highest death rates from asthma in, in Europe. Um, and part of that is because um, of what we think is, is because of the way we prescribe. So the reliever inhalers, those blue ones, um, people are much too reliant on those, which means they're not you know, often they're not using the preventer inhalers, which is the thing that actually reduces the, the disease rather than just treating the symptom. So we know that actually if people are more reliant on these Saba in, inhalers, the, um, the, 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 the um, things like Ventolin, they're much more likely to end up in hospital, they're much more likely to die, whereas the more they use their preventers, the less likely they are to die. So if we want to actually look at sustainable asthma care, and we you know think about a driver diagram for that. So first off, Vaccination, smoking cessation, um, reducing triggers. So things like advocacy to reduce air pollution, cold damp housing um, and patient empowerment. So supporting them to tackle things like cold damp housing, um, making sure that they're using their inhaler properly so that they're actually delivering the medication to their lungs and not to the back of their throat. Um, signposting them to this, you know, really fantastic online support from organizations like Asthma UK. Um, and then low carbon alternatives, yeah where possible an appropriate swap to dry powder inhalers um, but you know this is all the way down here it's not the first step we've got to get asthma care right first because if we get people using their preventer inhalers they're not going to use all those reliever inhalers because they won't need them so it doesn't matter you know to some extent which inhaler they're on they'll be using less of them so it's getting asthma care right making sure that it's really high quality care reducing people's symptoms as well as where you where you're using an inhaler switching to um, a lower uh, impact inhaler and then of course thinking about how they dispose of those inhalers to make sure um, that they're not being chucked into landfill still often half full leaking out you know um, hydro hydrofluorocarbons carbons out into the atmosphere you know greenhouse gases kind of sat there like on a sad party balloon gradually um, letting these gases out and then so finally sort of thinking about operational reuse oh sorry also uh, thinking about low carbon alternatives, also re reusable equipment, as I mentioned, with the um, with the the gowns, but also you know things like speculums, laryngoscopes, um, all this equipment that we used to put into the autoclave and now just gets chucked in the bin and we get a new one. So this brings us to operational resource use. So thinking about our our um, equipment, um, ideally through a circular economy, not kind of um, the the linear economy of use and chuck. Um, but things that can be um, recycled, obviously also lights, heating, um, that kind of stuff. So when we think about sustainable procurement, first of all, is the first thing is let's reduce the amount that we have to buy before we start thinking about talking to suppliers about choice of products, what kind of packaging is it coming in, using our collaborative power across the NHS to, to put more pressure on suppliers, but also stock management, making sure that we don't buy things that then go out of date because we haven't managed our stock properly, that we're buying, that we're you know, managing our waste appropriately, that we're recycling where possible. Um, so this is just an example from in thinking about procurement. So dialysate, which is one of the um, chemicals that has to go into um, dialysis machines, 
So rather than kind of having each one delivered in plastic bottles, having what they call central acid delivery so that you've just got one supply on the premises, it also means it's more resilient when there's, you know, transport disruption during extreme weather events. Um, and that just of itself, just having, you know, it delivered sort of pumped into a big vat rather than all in plastic bottles um, has, has a significant impact. You see 30,000 plastic canisters a year just for one hospital. But going even further, you can move it to concentrated acid delivery so you don't have so much volume to cart around or even dry powder and you mix it with water um, on, on the premises. Um, again, uh, another example from um, kidney care. So this is reject water. This is water hasn't been through the dialysis machine. This is just water that the system has rejected, but it's perfectly potable, it's drinkable water, um, but it's often put into waste. Um, so having systems that we can recycle that um, can, can re, you know, have a huge impact in terms of, of um, reducing our water usage. And this is a project that I really like in terms of um, on-site renewables. So this is a hospital which funded their renewable solar array through community bonds. So the profits from the energy generation go back into the community um, and some of the profits were also used to to fund a beat the cold charity so i'm um, supporting people who were living with um living with fuel poverty um but of course the the benefits to the hospital of having that cheaper supply of of energy was originally predicted to be large but of course with the increase in the cost of energy has is is now absolutely huge so sort of thinking about sustainable healthcare what does it really mean um so it's really it's really thinking about how we make healthcare which is properly patient and community centered um so it's 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 very high quality it's getting it right first time um but you know the most important thing is that prevention it's getting out into communities and dealing with the causes of ill health before they end up on our doorstep so we think about this in terms of sort of planetary public health. This is a report which came out recently looking at how public health over the last few decades has really started to focus on individual behaviour change rather than the conditions in which people are living. And what we know about individual change, um, individual behaviour change um, strategies and campaigns is they tend to have the most impact on people who least need them. Um, so we need to be refocusing public health back into actually the 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 sort of community-wide um system-wide issues and that really is going to, to to change that is going to require an economic transition um that addresses the root causes of wealth power and income inequalities and to build these flourishing sustainable communities in which we can all live we've got to listen to and address experiences of exclusion so classism sexism racism gender violence transphobia and also to the voice of the dying earth, the, 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 the earth which provides us with the basics of what we need to live. So if we think about how we can take action on this, so yes, we can make individual lifestyle choices, but if we look at the impact, um, this was a study from anesthetics, this is an average UK citizen, this is really green UK citizen, so this is vegan, not flying ever, no pets, no children. Um, yes, it makes a difference, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not huge. Whereas what you do at work, you know, this is this can reduce your carbon footprint by 30, 335 kilograms of CO2e a day. Yes, that is anesthetics where they're playing with these gases that have really high global warming potential. But it just gives you an idea of how much more impact we can have by changing the way that we do our jobs than we can by changing what we do at home. Not to say that that's not important. So, yes, we need we all need to make those individual choices if we can. But also, you know, working professionally has much bigger impact. And of course, working as a citizen has an even bigger impact because healthcare professionals are the most trusted voices in the in the population. So we need to use that voice. We need to be getting out. There's various different organizations working in different ways. So it's be lobbying or um, petitions or MedAx is working on the, um, the Green New Deal bill or organizations like Health for XR, where we're taking um, direct action. Um, and whilst it might seem an odd thing for doctors to be out kind of breaking the law um, and, and, and doing these things, we've got to remember that um, health activism has, uh, medical activism has a, has a long and proud history of making positive changes in public health. Um, this is the UN Secretary General talking about climate activists sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals 
that the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. Um, and that's what we're dealing with. So, you know, this is the head, the editor in chief of The Lancet saying, um, during the first um, Extinction Rebellion activities in London in April 2019, that actually we're in such a severe crisis now that doctors and health professionals have almost an obligation to engage in nonviolent social protests to affect, to address the climate emergency. Um, so that's why I'm part of this organization. I'm very proud to be part of this organization. Um, that's not to say that activism isn't, isn't, isn't often difficult. Um, it's frightening to be breaking the law. It's not something that I ever thought I would be doing. Um, and, you know, I just like to highlight these six amazing, um, these are some of the best people in the world that I know, doctors and nurses who cracked the glass of JP Morgan, who's the biggest um, investor in fossil fuels um, in the world. Um, and they're, you know, facing court, potentially a, a custodial sentence, which is heartbreaking. Um, but but we as health professionals, we have a duty to raise our voice around this. And that's one of the perhaps the most impactful public um, health interventions that we can that we can make. So I just want to leave you with the words of Albert Einstein. The world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. And we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So I know I've run on a little bit and I haven't left too much time for questions, um, but I'm going to stop sharing now and open the floor. Um, please do turn your cameras back on so that we can see each other a little bit. Um, and just stick your hand up um, if you if you have a question. <laughs> 